Hi, and welcome to my course on C Sharp and web development. I'm going to give you an introduction to what you would learn here in the next few activities. So first of all, some background of where you should be and if this course is for you. So I teach three different levels of C Sharp and software development. In level one, we talk about just the basics of programming and how you can build statements that cause your program to execute. So it's for people that are beginning and they've never seen programming before. The second class is a little bit more advanced. We start getting into some things about object-oriented programming, some things like recursion, multiple projects in one solution, and so our applications are a little bit more sophisticated and students continue to learn new features of programming languages. This course that we're talking about now is the third course in the sequence. And so we start making web applications using C Sharp. The tool or the framework that we use is called ASP.NET. And we create websites, database backends, and make the full stack happen. So this is for, more for advanced students, students that are at least second or third year into their university experience at Grand Canyon where I teach. The environment that we're working with here is with Visual Studio. So I know you can run ASP.NET with Macintosh or Linux or whatever. It's multi-platform now. But we're going to be using Visual Studio on a Windows environment throughout all of the tutorials here. In my experience, it works very well and um, it makes the, the instructions easier for students to understand. So let's talk about each of the activities. The first activity that we're going to do is an introduction to how a framework like ASP.NET is designed. There's a lot of pieces to it and if you're a brand new programmer to web development, it's somewhat overwhelming to see what all the components are. So ASP.NET uses the MVC pattern, Model View Controller. And so we start to examine each of these, the views, the controllers, how to pass data from one event to another. And then we talk about some software design principles because the students that are in my class are going to be working together in small teams or in pairs. And we're going to simulate what it's like to work on a team using Agile and running through sprints. So that's what activity one will look like. In activity two, we start doing some more programming and a little bit more in depth. When we're done here, we're going to be able to create a registration and login application. So this means we're going to have a database, we're going to have user models, we're going to have multiple views and controllers all handling this basic process. ASP.NET has its own language called Razor, which is used for managing the front end. Now when we get to activity three, this is going to be a quite a large unit. We're going to make a full CRUD application. So CRUD stands for create, read, update, and delete. So the basic database operations that you can make an application do. So the first thing you're going to see is we're going to manage lists of data. So we'll create an object called a product and we'll show it in a table. And then we can query that table. We're also going to look at some other tools besides just C Sharp. So there's a nice uh, set of tools that we're going to look at to get fake data from, or you might call it filler data or placeholder data. So the first library is called Faker. The second one is called Makaru, which is a nice website for creating data. We're gonna look at some pictures such as the uh, Pravatar, which is a way to generate thumbnails, or Lorem Flicker, which is a way to insert pictures for your products. And so different ways to generate placeholder data. Then we're going to have multiple data sources. And so we're gonna create an interface using some object-oriented programming terminology, an interface which allows us to swap out a production or a um, test database. And so our application will be able to switch between the two sources automatically and fairly easily. The second uh, or the next item that we're going to look at is how to set up layouts because each page on a website is going to have a header, a footer, a main body, and so forth. And so we'll look at some of the designs of how the layout file is set up and how to make our own custom pieces of that. Well, let's go then to the next section, which is about customizing the way that your website looks. ASP.NET and C Sharp uses Bootstrap to style its pages, and we're going to modify that a little bit using Bootswatch, another website that is good for front-end design work if you're trying to do something quickly and still look good. Then we're going to change our table into a set of uh, cards. So you can see here, these three things, these three products are each on their own card. So a card is a picture, has some text and maybe some buttons. 
And now we want to be able to display those on a nice flexible display. So when the website gets narrow, the cards automatically reshuffle. So this is going to require us to do some things with CSS and the Flexbox tool. Now we're going to go for lastly in this unit and we're going to start creating a simple game. And the game that I'm going to create is called Button Grid. It's pretty simple. All you have to do is click a button, it changes color, and the goal is to switch them all to the same color. Now there's a lot of things involved in how this works. There's a data set of the game state in the background. There's click events for each button and how to update the display. Now, why we're doing this is because in my course, as you're in my classroom, you're going to learn how to create a Minesweeper game. And so you won't see any tutorials on the video of how Minesweeper itself works, but we'll do tutorials on this thing called Button Grid, which is very close. It's a, it's a model that you can base your um, milestone projects on. So even though I might not show you exactly how to create a Minesweeper game here, you're going to see some things that'll help you in many ways. So activity three has a huge amount of data, new information for programmers in web development with C-sharp. On Ajax, we're going to go with activity four. So Ajax is the technology that is used for partial page updates. So if you click a page without Ajax, if you don't have Ajax working, every time you click a page, the entire page has to reload, which is kind of slow and clunky and especially people on slow internet connections are not going to like your app. So Ajax has been around a long time. It's a technology that uses JavaScript to make partial page updates. And so you can see, we're gonna start without C Sharp. We're just going to go with straight HTML and jQuery, and we're going to build an example of a playlist. And so this will show you the, the HTML and CSS and JavaScript to make them happen. So you're gonna see that is our first example. Then we're going to switch into Visual Studio again and start programming in C-sharp with ASP.NET and do the same concepts. So we're going to have something like this. We're going to have a list of people. When you click one of them, a partial page update will display the details of the customers below. Then we're going to go revisit the button grid game, the game where we have all these buttons that we can click on. And instead of refreshing the entire page, when you click a button, the page will only refresh the button that you clicked. And of course, that's, it makes sense. Why would you want to display 25 buttons all over again if only one of them changed color when you clicked it? And so Ajax and the partial page update will make sense here. Then we're gonna go back into the products app that we created in activity three, and we're going to have the edit feature now added. So why would you want to display hundreds of cards on a page if only one of them has been changed. So for example, when you click edit, you're going to see a modal dialog box appear. So this is in JavaScript using bootstrap uh, formatting, and you can enter in the details of this one here, such as the pizza product. And then when you click save, the pizza section of the page will update whatever product that was. And the rest of them, all 99 or 999, will not be updated. And so Ajax makes sense when you're doing partial page updates, when you're doing an edit operation. Now let's go on to the next activity. In activity five, we're going to move into what's called a REST API. So a REST API is super important when you're dealing with multiple types of clients. So we have one back end that has the data, but we want to have multiple front ends. And so the best way to do that is to create a REST service or a RESTful API, they call it. And so you can make a different version of your front end for your mobile phone, for your desktop, or for whatever application that you want to connect it to. So one back end, multiple front ends. And the way that works is you have to get rid of this idea that, that C Sharp does everything in your app. It can, but you might not want to do it that way. So we're going to revisit our products uh, application where we were showing all these different types of food and we're going to turn it into something that looks like this, <laughs> certainly much less graphical. But you can see the format here contains the data. So this is called JSON data or JavaScript object notation format. And so this is a universal format that most programmers can work with when they're building their own front end. We're going to introduce a program 
very popular for REST APIs called Postman. And so Postman is like your web browser. It's a client that can talk to a server, but its job is not to display web pages. Its job is to handle this JSON formatted data, whether it's submitting it or reading it. Postman is probably the most important tool that you'll learn on using REST APIs. As soon as you introduce the idea of a REST API, you're no longer tied to the front-end design that comes with ASP.NET. You might decide that your front-end is going to be written in a different stack, a different framework, such as React, which is a popular choice. So your back-end can be written in C-sharp, and your front-end can be written in React and JavaScript. That's just one combination. There are dozens of combinations of backends and front ends, but this is one popular example. And so we'll talk about some of the options there. Also, as soon as you get into REST APIs, you're going to think about what kind of data you want to actually share with your clients. So do you have secure information in your user class? For instance, does your user class contain a social security number in it or a birth date? You might not want to share that in your REST API. And so the technology to hide that data is called a DTO, or a data transfer object. And so we will code some data transfer objects to see how they work as well. Then we're going to go back to our button grid, and we're going to do what's called a right mouse click. So this has nothing to do with REST APIs, but it's just part of the, the course. It's part of the uh, progression in your development of the app. And so when we right click on an event, we need to handle that differently than a left click. Because in Minesweeper, as you might remember, a right click will place a little flag on one of the squares. And so we'll just figure out how to do that with a button grid. Then the next activity, we're going to start working with three different things. Debugging, logging, and security of your application. So let's start with debugging. So debugging is a way to stop your program and see what's going wrong or what's going right. So you can see here an example. If I stop the program, I can see in the user object who logged in. And so you can see that Bill Gates and Big Bucks was the username and password that was attempted on this application. Also, we're going to see that we can use the debugger to do conditional breakpoints. And so we will only look at the logins for a specific user, such as Bill Gates. You can set your uh, conditionals to be any kind of a logic statement that you can think of. Also, an important concept for programming to understand where things are going right or wrong is to look at the call stack. And the debugger will help us understand which module or which method called which other method, which classes are depending on each other. And so interpreting the call stack is a great way to understand why your application is working well or not. The second item here in activity six, we're going to look at the nlog library. So it's an extra actual installation, extra software that goes into your application. And so we'll be using the NuGet packet package manager to install it. And then the nlog tool will show us how we can track the, uh, the items that are the actions that are happening in our application. So think of if you wanted to log the event every time a user logged in, you want to record when and who it was. Or you might think about if you were creating a voting machine system and you wanted to create a log of every time that someone cast a vote so that you could verify if things have been changed or not. So logging is important for security, for tracking the ability of your performance of your application. And so we'll introduce the idea of nlog using the tools that are built in with Visual Studio. Also, we're going to look at action filters. So action filters are a middleware. It's like middleware, where you can decide when something should be permitted or not, or when you would trigger other actions automatically. In our example, we're going to use uh, actions to uh, filter out unauthorized page reviews. So we're going to check to see if a person has been authorized to view a page before we actually display the page. And that's what the action filter in our example will be used for. Also, we're going to talk about session variables. Since we're going to see if somebody's logged in or not, you better check to see if the server recognizes that this person belongs here. And so session management. Then we're going to use a singleton pattern design. So a singleton is not specifically for C-sharp or even web development. 
it's a universal uh, practice for certain types of uh, you know software that you want and a singleton allows a program to have exactly one instance of a class in our example we're going to have this nlog tool running and it doesn't make sense to have more than one version of nlog in your application so we're going to use the singleton pattern to show how this will be more efficient than having multiple log programs then the activity 7 is going to talk to us about dependency injection this is another design pattern not necessarily with c sharp it's universal for all languages but dependency injection is comes into play when you have multiple items that a class uses so you can see in this diagram so class a uses service a and uses service b one or the other and you can go in and manually change the code so that they're creating instances of that class however with dependency injection we kind of automate the process so that you can decide whether I'm going to use class A or service B on a uh, configuration file and so your code doesn't have to be modified if you make a change so in our example we're going to start with like a video game and we're going to talk about heroes that have weapons and the uh, weapon interface is going to determine which type of weapon is currently being handed out to the heroes whether it's a gun a sword or something else then we're going to go a little bit more serious example of dependency injection and we'll talk about two different types of data sources so let's say you have a data source that is a test database or a production database obviously if you're messing up the data in a program you want to test it with a test database so we're going to go back to our products application and we're going to have two different data sources so the first data source will be this one here which is from the faker data I believe it was called and you're going to see different products and then we're going to switch a data source to a different one this was the Makaroo generated data and this data is about food and so with one line in a configuration file we can change the data source of our application to be one or the other finally when we get to the uh, final activity we're going to be talking about two subjects link so link is a query language something like SQL so it's used to query through lists of items whether they come from databases XML files or some other source link is a Microsoft uh, feature in Visual Basic and C Sharp that is allowing you to select items so it's a selection language then lastly we'll do hosting so we'll talk about cloud hosting what are the benefits how does it work and also actually what are the mechanics of getting your application hosted on a cloud service so welcome to the class this is C sharp 3 this is web development I look forward to having you in class if I see you in person or if you're just one of the people watching online welcome as well and so let's get started now with our first activity in C sharp web development